chapter 12. We're going to finish this chapter this morning as we consider two kinds of people. Two kinds of people, two different kinds of people. Let's read verse 38 down to verse 44. Then he said to them in his teaching, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers, these will receive greater condemnation. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrant. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given in the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Father, thank you for this passage. I pray you will use it in our lives to build your kingdom. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. What a great story. So much I could say about it. I'll get to that in a minute, though. Don't want to jump the gun. But this whole passage has been about Jesus dealing with with the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. They're after him. They're going to get him. We've already read the end of the book. We know what's going to happen. But the point is, when he sees this, he even warns people. And I don't think he needed to warn them too much because they didn't like the Sadducees, the scribes, or the Pharisees. The common people did not. But let me ask you this. What would you do for a person who risked their life for you? Maybe someone has. Maybe they got you out of a burning building or out of an automobile that had been wrecked and was about to explode from leaking gasoline or saved you from drowning. If you found out that this person was very poor and had little, what would you do to help them that helped you? But what if they were not poor but very wealthy? What would you do then? In spite of how our world views people, there are only two kinds of people on this planet. Those who live for God and those who don't. There's no middle ground. Which one are you? In this account written by Mark, we see two kinds of people mentioned and how easily it can be seen which one is which. Jesus has no need for someone to point out the two kinds of people because to him, he knew exactly who they were. He knows each kind and points them out for us to see and his disciples. So I pray that after our time today, we'll make an effort to be more like those who do everything knowing our Heavenly Father is watching. He wants to see his son work through us in many ways. Yes, I know we still live in the flesh, and living in the flesh keeps us from seeing things from God's perspective, but that's where the effort comes in, to point us to remember our Lord and Savior in everything we do. 1 Corinthians 10.31 whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. These two kinds of people mentioned in this text lead us to realize that there are two kinds of religion that either will direct our lives or not. Let's consider these two kinds of religion that show two kinds of people. The first kind of religion, and I'm real Uh, I'm a wordsmith when it comes to things like this. The wrong kind of religion. That's it. Nothing elaborate. Just there's a wrong kind of religion 
in verses 38 to 40. Notice that Jesus gives those listening a very stern warning. And the warning is against the scribe, and he says, beware of them. Now, what do they do that's so bad? Well, Jesus lists some things here. Let's look at it. They love to wear long, flowing robes. And I know, guys, that you have some of those in your closet. No, not really. I think the Johnstons gave me a kilt some time back. Thank God it's way too big. I'm not going to. I couldn't get, I, well, I couldn't even hold it up. It would fall right off. But what does a long flowing robe do? Well, when a model walks down the runway, she does so so that people will notice her. But it's not her, it's what she wears. But in the case of these scribes, they wore long flowing robes so that they would be noticed. You say, for what, what were people to notice about them? For their place in society. They were better than everybody else. Don't you love to interact with people like that? They wanted men to see and notice them. Therefore, they wore something that would gain the attention of the people. And I firmly believe this. I think it's an old saying, a true saying. You cannot gain respect, but in one way. You earn it. It's not just given to you. And what's interesting about these robes is they're only good for one thing. <laughs> one thing. You couldn't work in them. So all you did, you did so people could see. Now that's, that was the culture of that day. Jesus went on and said they love to be greeted in the marketplace. Uh, Ruth, I didn't tell you. I've got the red mic up here. Uh, the other one was blinking. You did good. You can see red all the way from back there? Oh, okay. All right. I was going to say, I can't even see it from here. That's okay. They love to be greeted in the marketplace. They would walk through the marketplace with this long flowing robe on just to hear the lower class say, Good morning, Master. Jesus goes on and says, They love the best seats in the synagogue. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a synagogue, especially 2,000 years ago. I know you haven't. But these were the seats in the front where everybody could see them. They wanted to be seen and recognized as the elite and from what we've seen so far, they certainly acted as if they were better than everybody else. And Jesus goes on and says they love the best places at feasts. Now, if you've ever noticed, if you've seen the painting by Leonardo da Vinci of the Last Supper, and Jesus sitting and then the disciples around him, uh, that was probably not exactly the way that a table in this period of time was set. Tables were very short. You reclined around. You basically sat on the floor or on pillows and so forth. But the host of the feast would place his highest honor on the person on his right. And then the second on his left. And then they would alternate as they went around the table. So you could look at the table and tell who was the most honored by where they sat. I often thought we should really honor the front seats in the church because not very many people sit in them. I'm just kidding. You. you can sit in the back. It's okay. But notice what else. Jesus, what he has said, everybody knows about, but there, verse 40 Maybe some didn't know about it. Listen to what he says. They devour widows' houses. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, as a scribe, you see, they didn't have an income. Unless a person brought a letter to them, they wanted the scribe to write. Now, you got to realize when a scribe wrote something, it was well done. 
You didn't have printing presses back then. This person had to do it all by hand. And a scribe had no income. However, they made it clear that if you supported them, you would be blessed. The word devour here has a negative idea behind it. It's not, there's nothing good about it. And no doubt, from what Jesus says right here, they wrangled widows out of their homes. This was done by using their position to promise spiritual blessings to widows. Does that sound familiar? There are people on TV that do the same thing today. I heard this one preacher said, I don't care if you lose your job, you still tie to the church. Well, you're going to have a hard time finding that principle in here. It's ridiculous what some of these links they will go to. You remember what happened some years back? A guy said that God told me that if I didn't raise so much money that he was going to kill me. I, said, I would have told him to his face, you better get your affairs in order then. <laughs> Either way, the scribes benefited from this unethical practice. I mean, these ladies, these... Uh, Widow ladies could even give their home to the temple if they wished to do so. Uh, some commentators that I read said this was a common practice. No wonder the people hated them. You say, well, Brother Keith, what about the people in these large churches where the pastors do the same thing? Well, they're getting what they deserve. I would like to say people are not that gullible, <laughs> but they are. And then Jesus ends it up by saying they would make long prayers for appearance sake. Listen, after stealing from widows, promising blessings, after being set themselves for life because of stealing, they would get up and pray long prayers and probably the prayer was to people, not God. You say, well, Brother Keith, why is that so bad? Well, I think you know that. It's going on today as well. I don't call myself wealthy unless I go to Haiti. People in Haiti would call all of us wealthy. Because some of them don't get three meals a day, don't even get two. They're lucky if they get one. There are preachers, and when I say preachers, I put quotation marks around that because I want to draw your attention that they're not. Use every argument to get you to support their ministry. I need a $20 million jet so I can spread my false teaching all over the world. Or God wants everybody to be rich. Have you figured out that's not true? And some people think, well, God's going to use the lottery so that I can be wealthy. It doesn't work that way. Because if you can't handle a little bit, you can't handle a lot. That's what Jesus said. He said, if you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in much. If you're not faithful in little things, you won't be faithful. But folks, listen closely to what I'm saying. I know when, when we don't feel well, we stay home, and sometimes we watch preachers on TV. Anytime a preacher draws attention to himself, stay away from him. That's not my job, to draw attention to me. I could care less about me. I care about him. And if a preacher doesn't care about him, then he's not a preacher. I don't know what you call it. We are to point men and women to Jesus Christ, not ourselves, not pad our pockets, sometimes with a person giving all they have to support a lavish lifestyle. It's ridiculous, and yet people still do it. I have saw and have read and I've seen this, that some of these preachers were asked, well, these 
you know, thousands of prayer requests that you get that have an offering in there. Do you read the prayer request? Well, sure I do. And then the people that actually work there said, no, they don't ever read a prayer request. They just get the money out and throw the rest of it away. I could name names. But if you want to know who they are, you can come talk to me afterwards. I don't want to draw any attention to them. I want to draw attention to the one speaking right here. Let's go on. That's the wrong kind of religion. What's the right kind? That's verses 41 to 44. Jesus is sitting, observing the treasury in the temple. Now that was probably a either a clay pot or some type of receptacle that you could put money in. And you'll notice... They're not up here right now, but our offering plates have felt in the bottom. You know why that is. So it's pretty, right? Well, no. If you drop coins in there, it doesn't make any noise. And I've seen children put in just a few cents because it's all they had. Now, they're not a, a poor widow like this lady, and we'll talk about that. He, but notice what the text says. He was set opposite the treasury and saw how the people put their money. Not how much, but how. How they gave. And the very rich were giving. They gave large sums, but that wasn't all they had. And the very poor were giving. I just want you to know, this is not the only person going into the temple that day was this poor widow. There were other poor folks also. Mark doesn't mention them because Jesus draws attention to this lady. You say, how old was he? I have no idea. She could have been, I don't know. <laughs> doesn't say. And Jesus observes a poor widow who gave. Now how did she know, or how did he know she was a widow? Well, she didn't have a husband with her. And probably just by the way she carried herself, he knew. Of course, he's God. He knows more than we do. But notice what she put in. Now, the New King James is very unclear because this is literal two mites which make a quadrant. Well, we have no idea how much that is. The Greek word is lepta. You say, well, what does that mean? It's 164th of a denarius. You say, well, I don't know what a denarius is. A denarius is a day's wages, an average day's wage. I would say in our culture uh, around us, probably the average day's wages is somewhere around $100 a day. Now, if you don't make that much or if you make more, that's okay. So this lady gave 164th of a day's wages. Now, I did the math because I am so good at math. If the day's wage back then was $50, she would have given 87 cents. Now, if you say it was 100, you can double that. Just two copper coins. Why did that catch the attention of the master of the universe? Well, he calls the disciples' attention and calls them over to him to what this widow does and says this. She has put in more than anyone else today. I'm sure the disciples looked at her and said to themselves, there's no way she put in as much as these rich people. There's no way. But Jesus says it right here. They, The others put in out of their surplus. That's what we do, isn't it? Because I'm going to get to the point in a minute. Am I asking you or is Jesus Christ asking you to give everything you have in the bank to him? I don't think so. And we'll talk about that. The others put in out of how much they had, she put in all she had. Do you see the difference? There's a big difference. 
She had nothing else to give. She didn't give 10%. She gave 100. She gave all she had to live on. You say, well, Brother Keith, why would somebody do that? And I've thought about this because I have meditated on this passage and I believe it appears in some of the other Gospels too. But I've thought about this and thought about this. I wonder when this lady walked by and dropped her coins in there, she didn't know Jesus was looking. Do you? Can you imagine right now up in heaven when we took the offering up, Jesus called some of the saints of old over to him and said, look down there at O'Brien Baptist Church. You see what that person gave? They gave everything they had. They gave more than everybody else put together. Yeah, that's a good thing. There's no doubt about it. Why did she do that? though? I, I ask questions like this because I want to know. Why did she do that? Because she had faith enough to believe God's going to take care of her. So when we look at the people giving, who gave sacrificially? Have you heard that before? Have you heard a preacher stand in the pulpit, maybe a revival preacher, and say, you need to give sacrificially? Folks, I'm here to tell you, you don't need to give sacrificially. That's what this lady did. She had nothing else to live on. Unless God puts it on your heart to do so. Don't do it unless he does. We're often told to give sacrificially. Folks, I'm here to tell you. I don't have much, but I do not. In my prayer time or anything else, God has not laid on me to give everything I have. Who's going to do that? Who's going to give all that they have, whether that's a large amount or a small amount? And why does this catch Jesus' attention? How does he know that's all she has? Because <laughs> he's God. That's why. Few, if any, will give all they have. And why did she do that? Well, I talked about it. She believed that God would provide one verse of scripture, Psalm 37, verse 25. I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. Now you can take that verse and say, well, I've been where people were Christians and they were begging because they didn't have anything. And folks, read the context of Psalm 37. The idea is if we are following the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our heart, he's not going to let us die of starvation. Just not going to happen. Why? Because it reflects on him. Maybe she had been in the synagogue one day and heard this psalm read. And she believed God will not forsake me. Well, you know, if that was just in the Old Testament, we might say, well, I wonder if that's a scriptural principle. But it's in the New Testament also, isn't it? 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Listen to what the apostle wrote. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful Can you imagine? <laughs> I thought about this the other day in my study. Can you imagine when we started passing the offering plate, people got up and started dancing? Ma making merry because God has given me the opportunity to give and who knows what he's going to do with this? Well, who does? If you think it all comes in the preacher's pocket, you can come look in my pocket right now. She gave with a good attitude. There's no evidence in this text or where this story appears in the other Gospels that she did that out of necessity or grudging. And don't let some guy stand in the pulpit 
and make you feel like you. And isn't it amazing, there's four Gospels, and there's only one account in the four Gospels of this happening. In other words, this is the only person in the four Gospels that gave everything. So is Jesus asking us to give all that we have? No, but the attitude behind giving means more than the amount. That's what he said. And people have asked me for years, and I have been in I have been in many services where a person would preach, they would go to the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, and they would bring up the 10% tithe. Folks, may I tell you that is not a New Testament principle. If you want to give 10%, that's fine. No one's no one's going to argue with you. I think it was my mom told me a story of a guy. This is in the town where the, a river came through the town and there was a, a mill there that ground the people's corn into flour or whatever else. And this small church, I don't know if it was Baptist, sounds like one, uh, was having trouble. And so they elected the guy that ran the mill to be the church financial secretary. Well, he knows about money, so what did he do? Well, every time someone brought their corn in there to be ground, without them knowing it, he would just slide 10% of that to the side. And in one year, the church had caught up on all its bills and was in the black. So if people gave 10%, it would be okay. But that's legalism. You'll never find Jesus saying, you must give 10%. You'll never find the Apostle Paul say the same thing or anyone else. Say, well, Brother Keith, you're just bursting my balloon. That's not what I'm trying to say. What, what we should do is what this verse says. Give as you purpose in your heart. Say, well, Brother Keith, how do I know what God wants me to give? Ask him. You don't think he'll tell you? I've got news for you. He will. And it may be a lot less than you think. But what if a Sunday comes and all of a sudden you just get burdened down with, oh my, I, I just feel the Lord telling me and, I, and by reading his word that I'm supposed to give more today. Then what do you do? You give more. I cannot tell you how many times I've counseled folks that said, oh, I got a check from the IRS that I didn't know was coming. I'm going to go buy this, that, and the other. I said, you might better hold on to it. God knows what's coming. Don't get rid of it. Debbie and I got a check from the IRS we were not expecting one time. You know what I did with it? I kept it. I did not cash it. Two months later, they said, oh, by the way, you owe us that amount. I just signed the check and sent it back. <laughs> Folks, we have forgotten in our culture that God is overseeing our lives. And he cares about you and me and how we spend our money. He does. You want the blessing of God on your life, do what he says to do. It's not an amount. It's how you give. Let me tell you this story. This, this is about Keith, and I'm not drawing attention to myself. I grew up in Baptist churches. I've heard the 10% tithe all my life, and I had been to a concert for this Christian praise band, and I was so impressed. This was back in 1973, four, somewhere around in there. When they passed the plate, if to support this, I gave them $20. You say, well, that's not very much money. In 1974, it was. 
And I got to thinking after that, you know, I've never given that much to my church. What's my problem? Now let's just turn that question a little bit when I ask you, does Jesus want you to give all that you have? Yes, but he doesn't expect you to bring it to the church. Rather, he wants you to hold on to what you have with loose hands. Don't hold on to it too tight. You don't want what you have to come between you and God. Are you willing to give all that you have to Him? In other words, is everything that you own, everything that you possess, is it being used for Him in some way? You do remember that what you have is really not yours. Remember the story I told you about my little boat in the Hillsborough River? Oops, that's a lesson I will never forget. As I sat on the bank after being thrown out of the boat and the engine is caught to one side, the throttle is tightened up, it won't slow down until it runs out of gas, I'm sitting there watching the boat go around and around in the middle of the Hillsborough River, sitting on a log, and I said, Lord, I've never given you this boat. I think now would be a good time to do that. <laughs> I said, so if it wrecks and tears up or sinks, it's your boat, not mine. I learned a valuable lesson that day because I had two sons that were very young at that time. They were in school. That's why I was in the river by myself. But I got to thinking after that, have I ever given them to God? And that's not to say that they're not his. He gave them to me. But what did I do with what I was given? And I remember, Michael, you might remember this, in you guys' bedroom when I wrote a letter. I wrote the letter and then had you read it, you and Matt both. And in that thing, I told them both that I was giving them to God. And that's a hard thing to do. Very hard thing to do. But God is faithful. I didn't know at the time what all would happen between now and then. But as I look at that and see how God works things that I had no idea he was working. I don't know if I still have that letter or not. See, you're not going to take what you have to heaven because they don't need it there. <laughs> if you've got gold and silver and diamonds, uh, well, they think so much of gold in heaven, they pave the roads with it. We often have so much more than we need. Folks, let me tell you something. This is from my heart, and this is from Scripture. You can go in the Old Testament and check this out. People brought their tithe. What did they? How did they bring that in the Old Testament? Off the top, first. In other words, if they sat down at their table with their family around them and said, "This is all the money that God has given us," then let's pull out of there what's his. Give that to him now. Let's do it now. Let's don't wait until we. Get to the end of the month and find out, well, if I hadn't gave you the Lord, I'd have enough money. Well, act like he doesn't know that. You know most problems in, in marriages, especially young married people, money is the number one problem in marriage. But when you give off the top, when you make an effort, to say, Lord, this is all yours. I'm just giving you back what I feel you want me to give. Because God does not want our leftovers. What have we just seen together? I pledge allegiance 
to the Lamb. He wants our complete allegiance. And folks, if you don't have much, you know what I found out? I realize this is all. I found out that the spiritual gift of giving, usually people that possess that gift don't have much. Read the book of Philippians. Was the poorest church in Asia. They gave more than everybody else. Because they knew God was going to take care of them. I ran across this. You probably heard it in song. What can I give it, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, give him a lamb. If I were a wise man, I'd sure do my part. What can I give him? Give him my heart. He wants that a whole lot more than he wants your life. I'm not going to get to heaven and start pulling everybody's wallet out and see how much money they have. Don't care. Now, the scriptural principles as to how to handle money, there's lots of them. This is just one of them. There's lots of them. And if we followed those, find out that God wants us to have enough to help other people. <coughs> and I, I've never been in the Salvation Army, but when you walk by them on the way in or out of Walmart or any of those places that you want to put money in there, they take care of you. Good for you. Be careful where you invest your money. There are ministries on television that you should not support. I don't know what they are. Come to me, I'll tell you. Don't do it. But local church, one of the best investments you can make. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. For our time. Thank you that Jesus Christ would give all that he had. So that people like me be in heaven with him that day. Father, help us to realize really not so much the amount, the attitude behind it. Father, I know from experience growing up in the family that I did. Years, I thought my dad was a was a person that handled money very well until I got older and found out that it was my mom. It wasn't my dad. She was the one that paid the bills. She was the one that bought the groceries. But she always kept back some to give. And Lord, we never did without. Ever. I don't believe when I was young I ever knew what it was to be hungry unless that was the feeling I experienced just before we sat down at the table. Father, you will not let us go. Your reputation is at stake if we're following you with our whole heart. Help us do that. Help us do that today. Thank you for how you bring passages like this to life in front of us. So that we can see what you bless our time now, Father. We pray in Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with us.